Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about work, energy and power. Now, we'd already spoken a bit about work and we spoke about the fact that work was equal to, hang on, let me just go back so I can write it over here, that F delta X, F net delta X cos theta was equal to the work done. And that's what we did yesterday. We spoke about F delta X cos theta equals the work done. But there are a couple of things that you need to realize. First of all, that work is a scalar. It is a scalar. So when we did our problem yesterday, we ended up with a negative value for work. So we need to discuss this. Positive network done on a system will increase the energy of the system. So when we see a positive and a negative when we're talking about work, we're not talking about direction. Okay, remember that's for vectors. Work itself is a scalar. So if we're seeing a positive value for work, we're talking about the fact that it's increasing the energy of the system. This means that the resultant force is in the direction of the motion and the object will accelerate. Okay, whereas if we have a negative network done on the system, it will decrease the energy of the system. In other words, what are we doing? We're saying that the resultant force, F res, is in the opposite direction to the motion and the object will slow down. So you can get positive and negative work, but you can get positive and negative work, but you must recall, and this is very, very important, you must recall that the what it means is different from if it was a vector. If it was a vector, a negative would mean that the actual work done had a negative it would be something happening in the opposite direction. Whereas, yeah, a negative net negative network saying that we actually decrease the energy of the system and then the object will slow down and why is that because the resultant force is in the opposite direction to the motion now let's talk about energy what you need to remember is that energy is defined as a capacity to do work so they are basically one in the same type of quantity where in order to be able to do work we need energy or as is defined energy defined as a capacity to do work so the energy of an object or system can be calculated by calculating the amount of work that it can do because it's effectively the same thing. The unit of energy is therefore the joule and it again is a scalar quantity. And again, we're talking about the um, conservation of energy, which you've probably learned many times over by now which says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. So that is the whole point about it being a scalar quantity. We can't lose it, we can't go in the opposite direction. It can only be transferred or filled, transformed from one form to another. So energy is transferred when work is done. Okay, when I do work on something, so if for example, I am pushing a big rock, okay, say here is a big rock and say I am pushing it, okay, and it's actually moving. What is happening is I'm converting some of my energy into causing there to be kinetic energy in the rock and I'm doing work on it, okay? So therefore there is energy being transferred when work is done. So there's a very important work energy theorem, very important. It is incredibly important because you are going to be asked at least one question in the final exams um, based on the work energy theorem. And it says the net or total work done on the object is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. It's equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. Or another way of writing it is the work done. I apologize. Um, Basically, the work done on an object by resultant or net force is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. Let's say it again. The work done on an object by resultant or net force is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. Right, so 
what you need to understand is that we can represent this in an equation where it says network done. That's W net is equal to delta K. Now delta K or K stands for kinetic energy. Now I know that a lot of you see have seen EK to stand for kinetic energy. And I must admit that I grew up with EK being kinetic energy. But nowadays they make it a little bit easier by calling it just a big K for kinetic energy. Both are correct. So if you've got EKF minus EKI as your formula, that is perfect because you're saying the final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. But you need to be able to recognize both. Okay, it's very important. So the work done on an object by result on net force is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. So let us look at an example because the only way that you can really get to grips with doing these questions is to well, do it, understand these sections is to do an example. So it says a girl skis down a 20 meter long slope which makes an angle of 30 degrees the horizontal. Okay, so here is the slope and it makes an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal and here is the girl and she's on skis okay and there's her hair and there are arms and here are her skis okay the total mass of her this her and her skis is 60 kgs there is a constant frictional force of 50 newtons which is obviously opposing the 60 kgs the direction that she's moving the speed of the skier at the top of the slope, yeah. Her initial velocity is three meters per second. And they also tell you the distance that she skis is 20 meters. Okay, it says calculate the magnitude of the net force parallel to the slope experienced by the skier. Calculate the magnitude of the net force parallel to the slope experienced by the skier. Okay, let's just stop for a second and let's just draw a free body diagram of the skier. Okay, here is the free body diagram of the skier and here is the slope. Okay, do you agree that there's obviously the force of gravity down? Okay, and there is a normal force which is perpendicular to the surface. And the force of gravity is broken down into the perpendicular component and the horizontal component. In fact, what I'm going to do is just erase that so you can see it a bit better. So you've got that coming down. Okay. What else? We also know there's a constant frictional force of 50 newtons and it's in the opposite direction. So now they say calculate the magnitude of the net force parallel to the slope. Okay, so do you agree her net force is going to be the force down due to gravity, in other words, Fg parallel, and the force of friction? That is going to be the sum of those two will give me the force that's parallel to the slope. So I can say that F net, remember it's the sum of all the forces, it's going to be Fg parallel plus the force of friction. Now we need to choose the direction as positive so that we can start working on that. So let's choose downwards as positive because that's how we're moving, okay? We need to choose downwards as positive. So then we know that that becomes Fg parallel plus minus the force of friction of 50 newtons. Now let's work out what Fg parallel is. Okay, we know that this angle here is 30 degrees. So therefore we know that that angle there is 30 degrees, right? We know the mass of the ski, well we know Fg, okay? And this is the opposite side and that is the hypotenuse. So if we were looking at Sarkatoa, this is the opposite side, that's the hypotenuse, so obviously we've got opposite. We've got the hypotenuse, so therefore it has to be the saw. So what are we saying? We're saying sine of 30 degrees is equal to opposite, which is Fg parallel 
over the hypotenuse, which is FG. Um, Greg tells us one thing. Normally, I would write everything, all the stuff I'm working out below each other so that, or next to it over here, so that people could see what I was doing. And I wouldn't be shy to use paper, okay? I know we should be saving trees, and I'm all keen for the environment and saving trees. But when it comes to test exams, test situations or exams, I'm saying forget about the trees, think about yourself and the examiner marking it. Make leave as much space as you can. I do not understand why this is here. I've just deleted this app, so I don't know why that's there. Just ignore it, please. Okay. So the whole point is that the whole point is that this normally would be found underneath here. But I don't have much space on this page, so that's why I'm using this white space up here. So please don't be shy to write all the calculations where you can find them, okay? So let's do that now. So let's go to our calculator. Uh, but before we do that, let's just rearrange. So Fg is a force of gravity, which is mass times acceleration due, gra due to gravity. So that is going to be the mass of the skier and her skis is 60. So it's 60 times the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9,8 sine 30. And that is Fg parallel. So now we can get out a calculator. So we can go 60 times 9.8 times sine of 30 close bracket equals 294 so this is equal to 294 newtons so what is that saying it's saying that on the skier there is a force down the hill of 294 newtons due to the force of gravity, Fg, parallel. And there's a force up, which is 50. So obviously she is actually coming down the hill because there's a net acceleration down the hill. So that is going to be 294 minus 50, which is going to be 244 newtons. And they just ask the magnitude, so you don't have to give direction. But otherwise you would write down the hill. Okay, so we've done that. It happens to be 244 newtons. Now it says calculate the maximum speed of the skier at the bottom of this 20 meter slope. Okay, now you could use equations of motion. You've got the initial velocity, you've got the net force, so you could work out the acceleration, you could work out, you've got the displacement, etc. etc. But but what we could also do is say that work done is equal to delta. K. So what is the work done? The work done is equal to F delta X cos theta is equal to K final minus K initial. Okay. The force down the hill is 244. The displacement, the distance that she is skiing in is the same as the displacement in this case, which is going to be 20. Cos theta we don't have to worry about because cos theta in this case is cos of zero, which is one. Great tools, please remember that your cos graph starts up here. Okay, so cos of zero is one. So because the, the this force, this force here is parallel to the direction of movement, the theta is zero. So we've actually got cos of zero, which equals the final um, uh, kind of kinetic energy, which we don't know, minus the initial kinetic energy, which we can work out, because we know the initial velocity was three, so it's going to be a half times by 60 times by three squared. Okay, so because the theta is one, so it goes away, so we've got 244 times by 20 plus a half times by 60 times by 9 is equal to kf, the final kinetic energy. So let's pop it in our calculator. So we've got 244 times 20 equals plus bracket 0, 0,5 times 60 times 9 close bracket equals 5150. So the final kinetic energy is 5,150. But they didn't ask us for the kinetic energy, they asked for the speed, the speed. So we know that Kf 
is equal to half mv squared, which equals 5150. So it's going to be a half times the mass, which is 60. v squared is equal to 5150. Therefore, we can say that v, v is equal to, so I'm going to pop that in a calculator, and I'm going to go, well, we can say it's 5150. And I'm going to divide by 30 because a half of 60 is 30. So I'm going to divide by 30 equals, and then I'm going to square root the answer, equals, and becomes 13.102. Round off to two decimal places is 13,1. So the final velocity is 13,10 meters per second. So that is the speed. The maximum speed of the skier at the bottom of the 20 meter slope. So do you see how, because they let us there, we could work out the net magnitude of the net force and then use that within the work energy theorem to work out the final velocity of the skier. Okay, so that's a very nice question and that actually is a grade 12 exam type question. So please be aware that you should be able to do it. Okay, now conservation of mechanical energy. You need to know the difference between conservative forces and non-conservative forces, especially because it's kind of new in the curriculum, so they like to ask it. A conservative force is a force for which the work done in moving an object between two points is independent of the path taken. It doesn't matter what the path is, it will, the amount of work done will be the same. For example, gravity, electric forces, magnetic forces, in other words, all your non-contact forces are conservative forces. Um, so in other words, if you think about it this way, if you are taking off an airplane, okay? So let's say, oh God, I can't draw airplanes. Okay, so but let's try anyway. So you're taking off an airplane. Really, I can't draw airplanes. Okay, right, you're taking off in an airplane. Oh, my word. And now it's just gone away. What happened? There we go. Um, taking off an airplane there, it looks a bit like a bird. Okay, and there is the wing, and there's the other wing. Yes, it definitely looks like a bird. Okay, fine. Now it's a bird. Okay, so they're watching a bird fly. <laughs> okay, right. And it is going up to a certain height over here. Okay. So now it is going, I really wish I could copy and paste now. Okay, it's going up to a certain height over here. Right, now, as far as gravity is concerned, all that has happened, it is it has gained height, okay? And gravity, all gravity cares about is the amount of high, how high something is above the surface of the earth. It doesn't matter for it if this did this type of circling to get to this position, or if you went straight up, okay? As far as the acceleration due to gravity or the energy that you've gained against gravity, it is to do with the height. And this is what this non-conservative or conservative force is saying. The conservative force is saying is that it doesn't matter which way we go, it's independent of the path taken, okay? And typically your non-contact forces are the ones that don't care which path you took to get to where you are. Whereas a non-consecutive force is a force for which the work done in moving the object between two objects is dependent on the path taken. So there is a called non-conservative or where there's a new word dissipative forces and you need to know both words because they're both important. Okay, so for example, friction, air resistance, tension and applied force. Why? Because we know for a fact that if you've got, say for example, you're climbing a mountain and here's your mountain. Okay, right, so your options are either to go around the mountain like this, okay, and then around it like that, and around it like that, and around it like that, and then finally up here, okay, and here's your flag, for example. Now you've planted a flag because you're at the top of the mountain, woohoo, okay, and here you are next to your flag. Okay, but if you were busy climbing the mountain, and let's say this mountain was covered in snow, do you agree that, oh, 
do you agree that the amount of friction that you experience will depend on the length of this path, right? Whereas if you did something a little bit more different, different, let's say you had a lot more energy, you were fitter, okay, you could actually decrease the length of the overall path by going like this. Okay, so you would go a bit steeper because you work with so it would be a bit more work against the force of gravity. But with respect to the amount of friction that you're going to overcome, it will be a lot less. Why? Because the friction that you experience is on every footstep. And if you're walking fewer footsteps, then obviously you're going to have less friction. So that's just an example. Okay, so like we have said before, energy is conserved. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can be only transferred from one form to another. That's very, very important. Energy can only be create, transferred from one form to another. Mechanical energy is the ability of an object to do work. So what we say is mechanical energy is the sum of the object's gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. Okay, it's a sum of the object's gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. So EM is equal to EP plus EK, or in, we've already discussed that instead of EK, you can write as K. Instead of writing potential energy or EP, you could write U. Okay, so somebody in their wisdom said U would be a good letter for the potential mechanical energy. Right. So when only conservative forces are present, the mechanical energy is conserved. When non-conservative forces are present, then they're not conserved. But the total energy of the system is conserved. So what we're saying here is, for example, if we've got friction, then obviously there is some energy that is lost due to overcoming the friction and it might be transferred into heat or sound or whatever, okay? But the total system is, has energy that's conserved. So even though the objects in this um, mechanical, in the system, like in the objects themselves, might have a transfer of energy, the actual total energy of the whole system remains constant. So let's talk about gravity, gravitational potential energy. This is the energy an object has due to its position in the Earth's gravitational field. So EP, or U is equal to MGH, where M is the mass, it's always in kilograms. G is gravitational acceleration. Again, okay, H is the height above the Earth in meters. Okay, and like I said, it's also given the symbol U. The object gains gravitational potential energy when it is lifted up in the Earth's gravitational field. So the higher the object gets above the surface, the more the gravitational potential energy, the more it is gaining the whole way through. Kinetic energy is the energy an object has due to its motion. So this is how fast it is because of how I mean, how much, how much energy it has because of how fast it's moving. So EK, which can also be represented as a big K, is given by half mv squared, um, where m is the mass, which is in kilograms, and v the velocity in meters per second. Right. So let's talk about this girl that is dropping her ball. Okay. Do you agree that since she's dropping it, she is dropping the ball? Dropping the ball. Okay. I don't know why it's doing this. Dropping the ball. Okay, right. We have got a point here where we know always that u plus k is equal to u plus k, right? So, in other words, we know that u at the top plus k at the top has to equal u at the bottom plus k at the bottom. Why? Because we know that there is a conservation of energy. Okay, but what's important and what you need to realize is that also what's happening at the top here is the following. Because this object is stationary, what is 
the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy at the top is going to be zero because their ball is stationary. But the UT, okay, is going to be at its maximum. Why? Because it's at its maximum height. So therefore, the potential energy this has, it has at its maximum height. Right, now as this ball drops, what happens? Well, first of all, do we agree it loses height? Okay, and secondly, do we agree it gains speed? It gains speed. So therefore, can you agree that as we go down, the UT is going to get bigger, but the UK is going to get smaller. What have I just done? I've done potential energy. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't know what I just did. Let's rearrange that. We can say that the U, just the U itself, not UT. The U, the potential energy is going to get smaller, but the kinetic energy is going to get bigger. Okay? And that's what's happening. And we get to point halfway. At halfway, these are going to be equal. Okay, halfway the U is going to be equal to the K. And then we carry on and on and on and on. And we get to the point just above the ground. And if we get to the point just above the ground, what do we know? We know that the potential energy is going to be what? The UB, potential energy at the bottom, is going to be zero, right? What is the kinetic energy? The kinetic energy just before it hits the ground is going to be at its maximum. Okay, and what you need to understand is if there's no air friction or it's so little we can ignore it and there's no noise energy then all the energy at the top can be transferred down to the energy at the bottom. So there's a transfer of energy going through this whole process. Okay, now let's do a couple of examples because that's really the only way that we can get to know these things. Okay, so it says a pendulum, there we go, here's a pendulum, has a mass of 300 grams, is attached to a ceiling, it is pulled up to point A, which is a height of 30 centimeters. Okay, 30 centimeters. Oh, sorry. Thirty centimeters. Do it again, and it says calculate the speed of the pendulum when it reaches B. Assume that there is no non-conservative forces acting on the pendulum. In other words, what they're saying is assume that friction is effectively zero. Okay, so there are a couple of things that we need to realize. We need to realize that the thirty centimeters needs to be in meters. Okay, so we're going to take our 30 and divide it by 100 to get 0 0.3 meters. So that there is 0, 0,3 meters, right? Now, what do we know? And this is how you need to be careful about writing this out. We know that EP plus EK at the top has to equal EP plus EK at the bottom. Okay, EP plus EK at the top has to equal EP plus EK at the bottom. Now it says, it says, it, well, this pendulum was pulled to a point here. Okay, and once it was reached there, it was held in equilibrium. And then it was dropped. Okay, so do you agree that it has potential energy at A, but it doesn't have any kinetic energy. It is dropped from zero. So there is zero kinetic energy. At the bottom, yeah, there is no more potential energy. And this, unless the string breaks, there is no way that B can actually have any potential energy because it's right at the bottom of the curve of the pendulum. So therefore, EP is zero. And what do we have then? We have some kinetic energy because we know that it is moving. Now, grade 12, you need to be very, very careful because if you wrote with your first line that EP is equal to EK, you will be marked incorrect. You'll be marked wrong 
because that's not strictly true. Although EK at the top and EP at the bottom are zero in this case, the rule is actually that all the energy at the top is transferred to all the energy at the bottom. And it doesn't matter what happened, wherever, that is the rule. All the energy from one form is multiplied. I mean, all the energy from one thing has to be the same as all the energy from the other thing. Okay, right, so now, we know that it's got potential energy, and the equation for potential energy EP is mgh, and the equation for kinetic energy is a half mv squared, and there's a reason I want to write this out, and you'll see now. So let's do that. We've got at the top, we have, now we can write out just EP is equal to EK, because we've shown this line. Now, to be, now we can do it. So we can say the potential energy is m times by 9 comma 8 times by the height, which is 0 comma 3, is equal to at the bottom, we've got m times a half times the v squared, v squared, and that's what we're working out. We're finding out how fast it is traveling, right? So now, do you see that we've got an m here and an m here? And we also know that it's the same object. It says it's pulled to point A, which is then height, and it calculates the speed of the pendulum when it reaches point B. So this is the same object, okay? And it has a mass, they've said, of approximately, um, where is it? Oh, it isn't, yeah, there, 300 grams, 300 grams, okay, approximately 300 grams. So I could substitute in 0, 0,3 year and 0, 0,3 year. But do you agree that this mass is the same as ma this mass? None of the actual ball has been cut off. It hasn't dropped off some legs and arms. Nothing exciting has happened, okay? It's exactly the same mass. So therefore, I can cancel. And the reason I'm showing you this is because the number of times they give you this type of question and there is no mass in the question and then my students go, oh, we couldn't do this question because they didn't give us mass. But, but, they can, you can do this question because if the object is the same mass, we can cancel it. Okay, so now what do we have? Now we've got 9, 8 times by 0, 0,3 is equal to a half of V squared. So therefore, we can say 2 times 9 comma 8 times 0 comma 3 is equal to v squared. And therefore, v is equal to the square root of 2 times 9 comma 8 times 0 comma 3. Okay, so let's pop that in our calculator. Okay, so we can say, oh, that wasn't very clever. We can say square root of 2 times 9.8 times 0, 0,3 all equal, that doesn't help us, 2.42. So the velocity at this point here is 2,42 and they've asked you to calculate the speed so you don't have to worry about a direction, we just have to worry about a unit, which is 2.42 meters per second, 2.42 meters per second. Okay, grade 12, before we carry on, I'm actually going to show you a little proof that shows you well, actually, yeah, I'm not going to show you proof. What I'm going to do is just really just reiterate the fact that because the mass of the object is the same, we can cancel out these masses Okay, but that's only if we've only got one object, all the objects stick together and they're the same mass. And then we don't have to worry about it and we end up with an answer with V as a subject of the formula and there's no mass. And chances are there will not be anything else that you have to worry about there. Right, let's move on. It says, a 60 kilogram skier with an initial speed of 12 meters per second. Okay, 12 meters per second. Coasts up a 2.5 meter high rise as shown in the figure. Find her final speed. Given that the coefficient of friction between her skis and snow is 0, 0, 0, 8. So they're telling us that mu k is 0, 0, 0, 8. And they say, hint, 
find the distance traveled up the incline. Now, why do we need to find the distance traveled up the incline? Because what is friction? Is friction a conservative force or a non-conservative force? In other words, does friction depend on the direction of the travel or not? And friction does depend on the travel, okay? So friction plays a role from this distance all the way up to that distance there, okay? It actually makes a difference. So what that means is that we actually have to take into consideration the distance that she that she skied, not just the height that she skied through, because of that coefficient of friction, which means that there is actually kinetic friction. Okay, so what are they saying? We've got a 60 kg skier, 60 kg skier, initial speed of 12, there it is there, coasts up to a height of 2.5 meters, and it says find her final speed given the coefficient of friction between the skis is 0.08, hint, find the distance traveled up the incline. Okay, so normally, do you agree that normally what we could say, is that EP plus EK at the bottom has to equal EP plus EK at the top. So this is what we would normally say, normally, okay? But this time we have some friction. So this time what we're saying is that all the energy at the bottom is converted into potential energy and kinetic energy at the top plus some work done against friction. So we're overcoming some friction. So therefore we can say that all the energy at the bottom is being converted to energy that gets us to the top, energy that's get us, kept us moving, and the work done against the force of friction. And please remember what is work done. Work is equal to F net delta X cos theta and that's where that delta x comes from okay and the f net is the force of friction so we'll worry about it at the moment but that's what we're saying is that we need to work out we need to work out that distance there right so let's just start off does the skier have any potential energy at the bottom no she doesn't so that goes away the kinetic energy is going to be a half times the mass of the skier which is 60 times by the initial speed, which is 12 all squared, is equal to the potential energy the skier has now, which is going to be m, sorry, it says p60, times by acceleration due to gravity, which is 9,8, times by the height, which is 2,5, plus the kinetic energy. Okay, so what is the kinetic energy? Has it gained kinetic energy? Well, it hasn't. Why not? Because we know it says, oh, actually, no, it says find the final speed at the top. So we actually need to find that out. Sorry, I thought we were going to just get to the top without any final speed. So we're going to give a half times by 60 times by Vf squared plus this dude here, the work done against friction which is going to be the F net, which is going to be what? Well, first of all, you need to remember that the coefficient of friction is 0, 0, 8. Okay, so it's going to be mu K Fn, Fn, right? Then it is going to be what? Then it's going to be delta X, delta x, which is the distance, which is, what did they say it is? Um, we need to work it out. Okay, so we need to work out delta x, and then we'll worry about the cos theta in the minutes, okay, if we need to worry about it. So then, mu k f n, we need to work that out. So do you agree that we've got a special triangle that says, this is 2,5 meters, 2,5, that angle there is 35 degrees, and we want this side here. So that side is the opposite angle of the hypotenuse. That there is the adjacent, and this is the actual hypotenuse. And we want the hypotenuse. So we're going to use Sakatoa. The sine 
is opposite of hypotenuse, and that's what we've got. We've got opposite, we want the hypotenuse, so we're going to use sine. So we're going to go sine of opposite, which is 25, over what we want, which is, let's call it hypotenuse, just for fun. Okay, so that's sine theta, but now theta is 35 degrees. So therefore we can say hypotenuse is going to be 25 over sine, of 35 degrees, so we need our calculators out. <gasps> so we're gonna go, we um, 25 divided by sine of 35, close bracket, equals, and that's 43.59. So the hypotenuse, oopsie, I don't know why I did that, sorry. Oh, I did actually delete this thing. I'm sorry. Let's do it like this. Sorry, this is 2.5, not... Two. Oh, that's what the problem is. Sorry. I'm using a new digital pen and pad, and I haven't quite got used to all the things yet. Okay, that's 2,5. So therefore, this is going to be... Let's just go back to it now because I've forgotten what the number is. That's going to be 4,36. So our pattern use is 4,36 meters. So that length there, that length there is 4,36 meters. So now we can say that that's 4,36. Okay, so now it's getting a bit long and it's already quite late. So what I would like to suggest grade 12s is that if you're watching this to pause the video or just take a screenshot and then I want you to try and finish the rest of the sum. All you really need to do is work out. We've got the mu k. If normal, it's going to be very easy. And then just solve for the VF. But try that at home and I will finish the sum for you guys on Monday and then we will carry on with more examples because we need to also look at um, examples that combine momentum with work energy and power. Have a great day.